taking a little journey uh, through uh, one of my latest books that I just released. Um, and my passion for megaliths goes back for many, many years. In fact, it precedes the crop circle work. And then through the work with crop circles, I actually rediscovered the megaliths in a whole different light. And um, the one thing that really amazed me about the megaliths is that um, we've come to accept a lot of the temples uh, as uh, places where they undoubtedly reference solar and lunar and other stellar events. Uh, but when you look at some of these sacred sites and the position of where they are and how much effort it took to actually create these things, uh, you come to the obvious conclusion that, they, uh, that the same effect could have been achieved basically by taking a bunch of wooden poles, putting them on the ground and figuring out where the stars are, where the sun is and the moon is. Anybody can do that. You don't need large rocks to tell you what's happening in the heavens. So there's still so much we don't know about the purpose of ancient temples. And, uh, the thing is that when you actually start looking at the temples from the lens or through the lens of the mysteries teachings, they actually begin to make a lot of sense. And that's what I wanted to do this evening. Because when you start looking at some temples that we know very well through the practice of initiation, by the way, which means to become conscious, that's all it means, suddenly a lot of these, things, these answers start coming forward. Um, so first of all, I want to begin today by examining the science of sacred space. Um, first of all, consider the fact that temples are far from inanimate objects. Uh, the Egyptians actually looked at the ancient temples that they built and they said, you know, we actually go around from room to room waking up each part of the temple as though we're rousing a sleeping being from slumber. And they did this every single day before dawn. So for them, the temple wasn't a bunch of rocks and stones and pillars. They were actually physical beings. They breathed and they actually went to sleep at night when the sun went down. And without exception, these temples also attract and anchor the Earth's tillering currents to the spot. We know this through years of work for people like John Burke, the late John Burke, who actually buried uh, electrodes around Stonehenge and Avebury. And we found, among many other incredible surprises, that the local electromagnetic field that surrounds the temple begins to suddenly attract itself to the henge just before dawn. What happens just before dawn is that the telluric currents of energy are suddenly attracted to the henge. And just as the sun creeps up over the horizon, a door opens at Stonehenge and many places like it, and the electromagnetic power of the sun suddenly rushes in to the center of the monument, sometimes at twice the frequency of the surrounding landscape. And the same thing was true also of the, of the temples in Karnak in France. Uh, over 80,000 surviving standing stones remain there to this very day. And a very curious and skeptical electrical engineer called Pierre Moreau spent a good portion of his life looking at these stones thinking, oh, they are nothing more than large rocks. I do not believe the new age that uh, they are anything living. Boy, was he wrong. He wrote one of the best pamphlets in the world where he actually measured these temples and he came to the conclusion that dolmens behave like coils, that menhirs behave like antenna, and stone circles behave just like batteries. So here's a, a, an actual skeptic taking a completely different view. And here, what you're seeing here is an animation that I actually created when I measured one of the mounds at the sanctuary near Avebury. Over the course of the year, I measured the energy field of the, uh, of the site, and if you see this from above, you can see how every two weeks there are these ripples of energy that expand and they contract around the mound as if it is breathing. And the, uh, the uh, red lines signify a masculine or positive polarity to the ripples. Uh, blue is female or negative. And they are influenced by the sun, the moon, and the rotation of the earth. So this, for me, was also proof that the sites are living and they are very much alive. And this electromagnetic energy is anchored and manipulated in place by the careful choice of the stones. If you remember your history, you'll know that a lot of these stones are not local. They came from a long, long way away. In the case of Egypt, they came from as much as 400 miles up the Nile. So clearly the stone was very important. And, they were, and they, the stones are important because they are packed with a specific type of quartz, and a lot of it. They are packed with iron and also magnetite. So you have to ask yourself, to what end? Because none of this relates at all to astronomy. You don't need any of this to measure the stars or the moon. 
Well, it turns out that when you look at these particular combinations, the minerals in the rocks actually generate altered states of consciousness. And it does this by influencing the movement of iron that flows in your blood, which plays a central role in transporting oxygen through your body. The other thing that it does, it influences the particles of magnetite that float in your skull. And remember, your, uh, your skull is, you know, we're made of two thirds of water, but most of that water resides in the skull. And within that water, you have millions of particles of magnetite which allow you to orient yourself to the Earth's magnetic field. And thirdly, it affects, of course, the pineal gland. And this is what leads to the creation of a chemical called DMT, uh, which leads to the creation of dream states, except that the dream states are actually very, very real. Um, so the temples essentially are creating the right neurological environment for accessing a different level of reality. And many cultures describe the energy in the most restricted part of the temple as a kind of hollow reed. In Japan, they call it the reed of heaven. Uh, in, in ancient Persia, they describe how the ritual caves, which are specifically found on sacred mountains, are connected to a gold, by a golden reed to the sky. In Native America, you have the, uh, in the Kivas, you have something called the Sipapu. And if you've ever been to uh, Southwest America, you'll see that there's a big fire pit right there, but nobody ever takes a look at this hole. That's the hole in which the energy is supposed to come down from the sky and information comes into the sacred site and also the spirit of the uh, uh, shaman can also escape back into heaven. And the same thing also happens in Central America. Um, the same concept is depicted by the twin serpents that ride up the side of the pyramids. In fact, if you look closely, the two of them form two intertwining serpents. Right there, each one of them is a, a pair of intertwining serpents. They basically represent the umbilical cords, which are said to provide a two-way conduit for the soul and as a door into an astral reference library. The funny thing is that NASA in 2009 actually validated this concept of something connecting the Earth to the heavens when they released a press uh, release, which I can almost remember verbatim because they used the word portal in a NASA press release. We're making progress, people. <laughs> they said that the Earth is linked to the sun by magnetic portals that open every eight minutes. I sent him an email ages ago saying, would you mind perhaps letting me know where these portals happen to exist on the face of the earth? And here are some grid coordinates which just seem to correspond with some of our famous sacred sites. No response has come, which usually is a good way of knowing that you're on the right path of inquiry. So as much as NASA would like to take um, credit for all of this, it turns out that uh, the Ayurveda in India was actually way ahead of them by 11,000 years. Because in 9,000 BC, they actually wrote, and I quote, snakes which move along the earth and in the sky and heaven, which are the arrows of sorcerers. Different language, but exactly describing the process that these pathways of energy flow along the earth and they connect to the sky. And why, what many such places also share in common is their description as places, as access points into the other world. And they all also have very rich histories of altered states. And in chambers such as the hypergeum of Hal Safliene in Malta, the electromagnetism combines with the resonance, and that resonance carries a frequency of about 112 hertz. Now, the archaeologists and the sound engineers didn't quite figure out what on earth is so important about this uh, frequency until a, a neurosurgeon looked at this and said, that's actually a very important frequency because it's at that particular uh, frequency that switches um, a something in your head that shuts down your mental processing. In other words, it shuts down your left brain activity and shifts the activity to the right, which of course, as we all know in here, is the area of the brain that relates to altered states. So perhaps the myths and legends associated with these sites are telling you a very important clue. In fact, the most resonant chamber in the uh, chamber of Hal Safliani is actually painted with a honeycomb pattern. It's reminding you that you are inside a kind of beehive. And we'll come back to that in a second. It's a very important observation. Now, oddly enough, or perhaps not oddly enough, since we're all megalithomaniacs in here, 
Uh, and by the way, I want to thank my tutor, John Michel, for, for letting me be here, because without him, I wouldn't be here, we wouldn't be here. He is the man. John, wherever you are, genius. Yes. <laughs> Let's not forget why we're here. Um, in fact, there's a funny story I'll tell you back at the pub later with John, just before he died. Um, I shall tell you now. <laughs> um, a friend of mine was actually uh, looking after him uh, on his last days, and I was, I was actually living in America. And I said, he said, she said, um, I don't think he's going to survive the night. I said, well, you tell that old bugger that if he goes before I buy him the three pints of beer I owe him, I'll kill him. Next morning, she phones up and she says, I told him what you said. He laughed and he died. <laughs> so there you go. Now, you, you know this chamber. Uh, I'm sure many of you have been there. Different shape to the hypogeum in South House of Fliani, but you know what? Same resonant frequency of 112 hertz. So obviously something is going on here. So with these facts that I've painted so far, and bearing these in mind, I want to propose an idea that explains the prime function of a number of temples around the world. And that is that as far back as 5000 BC, candidates perform a secret ritual inside certain restricted chambers in which they undertook a voluntary near-death experience, they left the body, they traveled to the other world for several days, and they returned to tell the tale. And what's more, such initiates were described as either risen or raised from the dead. And in the Near East, 2,000 years ago, this ritual was still referred to as a living resurrection. And it's not the story the Christian people have actually grown with. So, let's go and visit these sacred places which are very unusual now with different eyes and see what the ancients were truly up to. Alexander the Great gets very short shrift from history. He's uh, always portrayed as a big warrior, except no one talks about his metaphysical side, and he was a huge metaphysical side. In fact, without Alexander the Great, we wouldn't have the temples in Egypt that we see today. And one of the things that he did when he first went to Persia, or conquered Persia, depending on your point of view, he visited this place, the tomb of Cyrus the Great. And um, it's a, it has a rectangular chamber on top of a ziggurat, uh, it has an awkward, narrow entrance at the top. And what Alexander found when he got inside uh, was a golden bed, an empty sarcophagus, and garments, but no body. Very strange. It's as though the whole chamber was intended to be used by a person who was expected to return to his or her daily duties. Now, the legends state that Cyrus the Great was actually buried under the structure, not actually in it. Always listen to what the ancients are telling you. If you look at the local history of where the ziggurat is, in 2500 BC, there was a resurrection tradition that was performed every year. And it was done on the winter solstice uh, during the festival of Akitu, when a god of fertility journeyed into the other world and returned triumphantly three days later. The human reenactment of the ritual was performed by the existing ruler ever since. And what happened was, as, this, as that the ruler was disrobed in public, which is something we should do to current presidents, um, <laughs> and maybe prime ministers, you never know. He was disrobed in public, in full view of the public. He was then taken to be confined inside this ziggurat, which is essentially an artificial mountain, which is considered to be the threshold between the tangible world and the unseen world. They describe these places as the meeting place between gods and mortal people. And they stayed in there for a few days, and upon the return into the body, uh, the, the individual came out and he was declared risen. The early practitioner of this rite, I have found out to be a, a god-man called Mithras in 6000 BC, who then becomes the basis for the story of Jesus, which I'm not going to go there right now. Meanwhile, in Egypt, in 1470 BC, we are now going inside the tomb of Tutmosis III, which is very unusual in the, in the um, Valley of the Kings because it is full of anomalies. First of all, it has a well, which when you think about it, is a pretty redundant feature for a dead guy. Dead people don't get up and go for a drink. Also, the main chamber is unusually oriented to the northeast, which is not a traditional burial position. So the Northeast in traditional mythology is always associated with the access to ancient information or wisdom. It's the position technically associated with the uh, summer solstice. And then you have the oval sarcophagus. 
a superlative piece of craftsmanship. Would have cost a fortune back then. But there's a problem with all of this because Tutmosis' mummy was actually buried in the temple of Hatshepsut over the other side of the hill, a mile away, where Tutmosis had earlier built himself a mortuary temple. So you've got to ask yourself, what does one guy need two places to put his body? And then a fact is the fact that the whole chamber is covered in the most unusual text called the Treatise of the Hidden Chamber. And it's filled with instructions on how to proceed into the other world, which is a place as real to the Egyptians as the physical world. But unlike the physical world, this parallel place exists outside of time. And yet it is present and eternal and simultaneous with the physical. And the text claims that only through a direct experience of the other world can a person fully grasp the operative forces of nature the knowledge of which is said to transform a person into an ark, that is, a being radiant with inner spiritual illumination. All of these instructions and more cover the chambers of Tutmosis' resting place, but there's a small problem, because the text claims that the experience is meant for a person who is alive, and this is what it says. It is good for the dead to have this knowledge, for sure, but also for the person on earth. Whoever understands these mysterious images is a well-provided light being. Always this person can enter and leave the other world, always speaking to the living ones, proven to be true a million times. This is in 1470 BC. If they would already been doing this a million times, even metaphorically, it means that the Egyptians have had some access of controlled uh, soul journeying outside of the living body and they were able to come back into the body and they've been doing this for a long, long time. Because Egypt has many examples of burial chambers with absent burials. Here's another one. The Pyramid of Sep Kemket. The entrance and the internal rooms were found sealed. Even the innermost chamber was found sealed. Even the sarcophagus was found sealed. And when the Egyptologist ripped open the seal of the lid, there's, oh, there's no one in here but air. Why would they do this? Same situation exists nearby in the pyramid of Zayet al Aryan. So, we have two Old Kingdom pyramids, unburglarized, complete with sealed sarcophagi, but no body inside. I would suggest that this is clear evidence that not all funerary buildings were intended as final resting places, but served some other and possibly ritual purpose. So what's going on here? Well, to understand the ancients, you have to think like the ancients, not like we do, but from their point of view. And to the Egyptians and others of that time period, a tomb was considered a place of rest, but not necessarily a person's final resting place. And in much in the same manner, experiencing the other world did not require a person to be dead. On the contrary, evidence shows that after undergoing a secret rite of initiation, the candidates at these anomalous sites were roused from a womb-like sleep inside a restricted chamber and pronounced raised, a fact still maintained 20, 000, uh, sorry, excuse me, 2,000 years ago in the suppressed Gospel of Philip which ridicules in ignorant Christians who literally believe that a physical body can be resurrected after dying. And this is what it says in the Ban Gospel. Those who say they will die first and then rise are in error. If they did not first receive the resurrection while they live, when they die, they'll receive nothing, nada, zip. All of this suggests that when it comes to the t uh, temples, appearances can be very, very deceiving. So we move on to Saqqara, because it too is full of anom anomalous tombs. Uh, Saqqara, if you uh, basically look at its origins, it's actually named for Seker, who is the falcon god of rebirth. And that term also comes from a phrase in Egyptian called Sikri, and it literally means hurry to me. And it's the phrase that is uttered by Isis to help the god of resurrection, Osiris, find, his, uh, find her as his soul wanders the darkness of the other world, seeking to unite with his divine bride. It's such a romantic story, isn't it? And such factors identify Saqqara as a place when one goes not to be buried, but to experience a kind of rebirth, which is once epitomized and reenacted at Saqqara during something called the Sed Festival. 
The Seds Festival took place in the 13th year of the uh, Pharaoh's reign, and typically it was performed at the spring equinox. What happened was there was a public ceremony, and after the usual libations, uh, what we tend to call research, um, the Pharaoh basically also drank a libation, was set aside from the common crowd, guided into a restricted bridal chamber, and into a specifically and specially carved sarcophagus, and three days later, he reappears as though he has just risen from the dead. And he went on living well beyond his induced near-death experience. The practice was still going on in 1995 BC at the festival of Mentuhotep IV. So, Saqqara appears to have been originally been a ritual complex, and the burials came much, much later. If you're still in doubt about Saqqara, here's the entrance. Uh, it's a... Uh, it, you go in via what essentially is a field of stone reeds. Remember what I said earlier about the column, the reed that connects to heaven? This is it in the Egyptian uh, pantheon. And this place, this field of reeds in Egypt, was called the Seket Yaru. And Seket Yaru marks the passage into the Egyptian otherworld. And the same story appears in Sumeria and it appears in the Andes. And at Saqqara, we also find the earliest sacred literature offering a unique window into this unique ritual that connects a living person with the other world. And we find this written all over the walls of the Pharaoh Unus. And it's called the pyramid texts because, of course, they were found under a pyramid. And these texts, which looks like Neolithic wallpaper, they're beautiful. They represent a series of mystical experiences akin to those described in shamanism, but very different. Um, and they describe things such, such as the ascent of the soul, encounters with gods, access to special knowledge, and the spiritual rebirth of the individual. But most importantly, they contain the most detailed descriptions of the other world, how to get there, how to overcome negative forces when you begin the journey, and the correct use of spells and incantations essential for the soul to maintain its focus throughout the entire journey. But above all, the pyramid texts imply that they are intended as a ritual where the initiate was expected to return to a living body to continue his or her daily duties. And the text, closer to the sarcophagus, offers an instruction meant for a living initiate undergoing a figurative rather than literal death. And this is what it says. O Unus, you have not departed dead. You have departed alive to sit upon the throne of Osiris your scepter in your hand, that you may give orders to the living. So the message is very clear. It describes how the Pharaoh has ascended into the other world alive. He has essentially reenacted a symbolic example once set by the god-man Osiris, to the point where he is now able and has the power to communicate with two worlds exactly at the same time. The second clue that the pyramid texts were used as a tool for the living is a section in which Unus undergoes a spiritual purification and rebirth to the repeated chorus of, Unus is not dead, Unus is not dead, preceded by the return of his spirit back into his living body. No other utterance in this chamber encapsulates the central theme common to every esoteric tradition going back at least 5,000 years that the soul is capable of consciously disengaging from a living physical body, temporarily journeying into the, uh, independently into the other world, and returning as though nothing had happened, except that you are very much more aware and alive than when you began the journey. And everything in the Pyramid of Unus is designed as a metaphor of the initiate's journey into the other world. It used to begin on the east bank of the Nile, where the initiate was punted across the Nile, which is described as the river of forgetfulness, because you have to forget this world before you cross over. When he disembarked in the west, essentially, he would uh, go down a long uh, causeway. He essentially follows an umbilical cord following the path of the descending sun. And he essentially descended into a figurative other world. This was then followed by uh, uh, drinking a special narcotic, which basically knocked him out. It, it kind of engendered a kind of uh, a near-death experience where you have like one heartbeat per minute, kind of thing that you do in Kriya Yoga if you're especially good at it. And he spent some time inside the subterranean chamber in a womb-like environment. And after a prescribed period, 
which is anywhere between three and seven days, the initiate regained consciousness, reappeared on top of the mound to greet the morning star in the east just before the sunrise, which of course uh, is, the, uh, is the planet Venus, or in some other cases, the planet Sir uh, the star Sirius, which is of course the star associated with ancestral knowledge. And everything in the chambers has symbolic correspondence. Nothing is left to chance. The sarcophagus is placed in the west of the, uh, the temple uh, because that's where the path of the sun descends into the spirit world. They use granite, which is a volcanic rock, which transforms from molten liquid into solid form, perfectly mimicking the fluidity of the soul, wandering the void and then returning into a limited physical vessel. Uh, the word granite in Egyptian is mat. It literally means to, uh, to imagine, to discover, which are very appropriate terms for your journey in the other world. You're taking a journey to, of imagination, but very real, not just a shamanic environment, a very real world. And you go there to discover important information. Even black, the color of the sarcophagus, has symbolic correspondence to wisdom and spiritual resurrection, not just in Egypt, but in many ancient cultures around the world. Well, still in Egypt, um, have you noticed that there's a remarkable similarity between the drawings of the other world depicted in the book of the hidden chamber and the schematic of the angled shafts, wells, and chambers inside this place? I thought it was pretty obvious. Of course, it took me 15 years to work this out. Sometimes you, you got your attention on somewhere else. And I wondered, perhaps, does this basic observation help us understand this much misunderstood temple called the Great Pyramid? Well, let's take a look at what happens below the Great Pyramid and see if it makes any sense. Here we are at the well, uh, at the very bottom of the, uh, underneath the, the pyramid. It's a great journey. If you ever go there, uh, we're going there next year, and there's like a light bulb at the very end. They, they haven't got any money to sort of replace the light bulbs. And I take about 16 people under there, and of course, being the person I am, I'll say, Right, group, I just want to remind you that right now there are six trillion tons of rock above us. Move, you bastard! Horrible, isn't it? And then you basically uh, reappear at this chamber, which Herodotus describes um, in very um, clear terms. He says that there's an underground chamber beneath this chamber. Okay, so this is where, what he's talking about. Under here... He's talking about an underground chamber that exists into which the Nile flowed, where the initiate was punted into the actual, uh, into this mound. It was supposed to be the mound of creation. And then he was drawn up either by a bucket or a rope through the shaft into a rough stone chamber. Well, this is the one that we see today. This is the rough stone chamber. So if you actually do the ascent, you ascend the Great Pyramid via narrow, twisting, claustrophobic passages on your knees, which describes your humility in the process. And the further up you go into the interior of the pyramid, the taller and better constructed the passages. And finally, before you go into the king's chamber, you again bend in humility before entering the highest chamber of all. The thing you'll notice here is that um, as an initiate, you totally understand this because it's very symbolic of your levels of, res of personal resurrection because you start off at the bottom as a rough stone and you end up as in a chamber like a polished diamond. So the symbolism is all there. It's also uh, symbolic that the, um, the, the stones at the top of the actual chamber, the king's chamber, there are exactly nine of them, which if anybody knows your mystery's teachings, that's the number of perfection. And the whole point of initiation is for you to become as perfect as possible. Then you have the fact that the entrance to the Great Pyramid always faces grid north, which is symbolic of the association with the polar axis. The building itself is part of the world tree, the pole star being the upper world, the pyramid being the middle world, and the underground chambers being the underworld. So the entire building, if you're looking at it from an initiatic point of view, suggests and describes the ultimate journey of the initiate. And if you haven't got enough money to go to Egypt, well, you don't have to go very far. We have the same thing right in Tintagel, oddly enough, where I just drove from today. Um, there are a lot of odd similarities between the Great Pyramid and Tintagel. Uh, again, it took me a long time to work this out. It often requires just pulling back a little bit, you know, getting out of your head and seeing things from a different point of view. 
The first thing to bear in mind about the other world is that it's often described in every culture as an island in the West. And this is pretty much about as far west as you can go in England. And it is, of course, an island. And we know Tintagel, of course, as the site of the Arthurian, Arth Arthurian Grail myth, except that that story was only really popularized in the 18th century by Tennyson, who himself was a mason. And they very well know the story of resurrection because that story is still encoded in their third degree, where the candidate is taken up from the, a figurative grave and declared risen. So I believe that Tennyson was trying to rekindle interest in an ancient tradition that may once have been performed on Tintagel Island. If we accept this just at face value for a minute, just think about the Grail myth for a second. It's essentially a retelling, well, that's uh, one, one of the most popular versions of it. You have a king who is mortally wounded. He has to overcome 12 obstacles. He then reaches his, uh, the, uh, the end by marrying a beautiful uh, maiden, and then he resurrects his kingdom and himself from ruin. Uh, if you were an ancient Greek, you would say, that's plagiarism, because that's the retelling of the story of Jason and the Argonauts. And they would say, the Egyptians would say, that's plagiarism, because that's the retelling of the story of Osiris. They just keep rewording the story to appeal to a different audience in a different land. And originally, the island of Tintagel was itself a place of restricted access. Very few people were ever allowed to settle on there until the Normans showed up. And it was only settled by a secluded religious order, as though they were protecting something very important. So even from the 4th century BC, Tintagel Island was a place set aside from the normal world, much like the other world is a place set aside from our three-dimensional existence. But you know what? The story of Tintagel actually begins across the way. Very few people pay attention to this wonderful church uh, dedicated to Madrin in her original Celtic name. There are only two churches in England, as far as I'm aware, that are dedicated to the mother of the gods. One is here, the other one is next door in Boss Castle. Now, Madryn was a Welsh princess who said to conceive a child as though by magic. An Egyptian would understand that story because the same thing happened to Isis after Osiris resurrects as a palm tree and she basically manufactures Horus as though by divine magic. The important thing about this church, if you ever uh, go there, and it's a beautiful, beautiful site, you'll see that there's a tumulus inside the, um, the graveyard. And there's an arc of graves that was actually excavated around this mound. And the funny thing about the arc of those graves, there's no body found inside them, but they're full of precious stones that were brought all the way from Turkey, including gold objects. What strange body snatchers would take away dead bodies and leave gold objects behind, I wonder? It does make you ask questions. And they found that beneath the mound, there was another additional polygonal chamber uh, made of porphyry, and it too was empty. It still had a lot of precious objects that came all the way from the Mediterranean, and it was aligned perfectly to the equinox. And that's usually uh, the alignment to do with the initiation ritual. So it was suggested the site itself was, again, not used for burial, but appears to have served a ritual purpose. In fact, it may have even served as a preparatory area for the final phase on Tintagel Island. So let's go there. You know this place. You know, uh, unless we have visitors here, that's uh, described as Merlin's Cave. Uh, above, you have the remains of the uh, habitations from the uh, uh, 11th century onwards. Um, the funny thing is that Tintagel Island is a huge geomagnetic anomaly off the coast of England. So there's a reason why they chose this above other things. Uh, the cave itself is also aligned to the equinox, but not to the rising sun, as I thought. Now, thanks to wonderful modern software, we're able to actually find the correct trajectory. And if you go there and go inside the cave, there's a wonderful little pinnacle here. And every eight years, Minutes before the sun uh, rises over the horizon, you have the rising of Venus that takes place right over this pinnacle. And it continues going this way, and the sun is all the way over here, not actually aligned to the actual cave. Now, Venus was the first thing that the initiate would see after doing his or her other world peregrinations. The point about going to Merlin's cave is very important because 
First of all, before you begin your uh, outer body journey, you have to get rid of all your fears. You have to control your emotion or energy in motion. First thing they'll teach you in the mysteries teachings, you must be able to control your emotion because when you cross over and you have an outer body experience, you're gonna see stuff that is not relative to this earth. There are weird creatures and it's gonna frighten the hell out of you. So you must not be uh, distracted by this. You must control your fear to allow the passage across the river of forgetfulness through the field of reeds and then you are in a place called paradise. And the rest is up to you because now your soul is in control in another level of requirement. So this is all taught to the initiates before they went into this. So the idea is, to, is that you actually spend the night in the cave while the tide is coming in. And you can do it, by the way. There's a few ledges at the top. And um, you spend the night letting the waves crash in there, making you fearful. And by the morning, you bloody well better have that fear controlled because you've got to go all the way through the hollow of the actual island. And the island is hollow. It was one of the main sources of the best crystals in the Great Britain for as far back as anyone can remember. And there is an access tunnel, which has since been bricked up, at the top of Merlin's cave. And this is a fact. So where did they come out? We don't know. At this point, I'm going to speculate a little bit. Um, there are facts and there are speculation. This is speculation. I have a feeling that this well, through which flows a uh, wonderful, important energy line that our good friend, the late Hamish Miller, discovered, um, it, the line goes right through it. And it's very similar to initiatory wells, which hold no water, but they exist in Portugal at their most famous uh, temple in Tomara, uh, where the Grail is, by the way. That's a good book, that one. Um, and also in the Roslyn Chapel. So I wonder at some point, before it became used practically as a well, did it actually go right through the center of the island and it was used as a shaft for the initiate to leave? Maybe, or maybe we haven't actually found the exact shaft. So anyone with a curious dog, please see if we can find the shaft that's missing at the top of Tintagel. Well, nearby, if you've been there, you have a thing called a fogu. Uh, standard archaeological um, practice says that this is a place where they put all their vegetables because they had to, you know, obviously make a place so they wouldn't rot, which is wonderful, and I buy the idea until you actually walk there and you realize that the fogu is actually facing the wettest part of the island and their water runs right through it, which makes, of course, that you're going to die of starvation if that's where you put your food. So a bit of practical logic suggests that it was not used for storing vegetables. It is, however, carved into an, X, into an S curve, and that's where our good friend Hamish Miller discovered it perfectly matches the flow of feminine energy that flows through the top of Tintagel, what he called the Athena line that goes all the way to Ireland and all the way to Israel. So what's happening here, if you stand back and look at it as an initiate, you can see that basically you entered through the door that is facing the equinox sunset. That's the first thing you do in initiation. You have the equinox sunset at your back, you go in through the west, and you descend down these stairs into a big pool of baptismal water, because you've got to have baptism at the beginning of your ritual. Until English heritage put a drain there, uh, the water used to collect quite naturally. And then you go in, and back then the top was actually covered all the way. This, uh, the, you can see much more of it today because of erosion. The candidate would spend time inside what is essentially a womb. And it was originally covered all the way, and you spend a few nights here, and you then exit through the S shape to line up exactly with the equinox sunrise and Venus. So I would posit that we are looking here at an actual beehive chamber, um, the, what they call the bridal chamber, where the initiates carried out their other world peregrination. But that's not all, because nearby, uh, my other good friend, Paul Broadhurst, who writes the most wonderful books and who owes me three pints of beer, and that's on record now. Um, we call it research. There's Arthur's footprint. Uh, it's, uh, since this information came out, uh, everybody's been sticking their foot in it, and it's making the footprint much more like a weird polygonal shape. Uh, the same footprint exists in perfect condition at the Holy Hill of Dunard in Scotland, and they performed exactly the same ritual. This marks the spot for consecrating the power of the monarch, or the, the solar hero, whose power is reborn on the winter solstice. Because when you put your foot here on the winter solstice, you are essentially 
standing on the energy line that comes right through the church of Madrin, and the sunrise rises exactly above the church. So the energy is basically is shooting right up your spine and is giving you a bit of a, what we call in technical terms, the tingly winglies. Yes. So I'm suggesting that Tintagel is a deliberately designed ritual landscape temple. They didn't have to build it. They went to look for the things that matched the journey of the initiate, found it here, and they went about consecrating the, uh, or performing the uh, initiation at this site. Now this tradition of living resurrection and the access to the other world is also found throughout Scotland, and more so around the island of Mull. And there are many sects that have come here uh, following the ancient tradition of working with earth energies. Uh, there have been women's groups who were persecuted that lived there without persecution. Uh, we have the Druids who moved there. The Templars followed in their wake. And 2,000 years ago, a very unusual group of people called the Kaldi. And these people were supposed to be a cult that moved all the way from the Near East uh, following the, um, well, the ritual crucifixion of Christ, because that's a whole other story. And it was a sect, to all intents and purposes, identical to the Essenes, uh, to the point where both practiced the living resurrection ritual. Now, there are three natural and man-made temples used for teaching the mystery schools in this particular part of the world, and they form a perfect equilateral, equilateral triangle on the landscape. First one is here. It's the stone circle at Loch Bui, and the second one is McKinnon's Cave. Uh, this is not the cave. That's the cave. And you go in, and believe me, it's like standing inside the dome of St. Paul's Cathedral. And the first thing you'll notice is that the entrance is aligned to the equinox sunset. First clue that something is going on here. The second clue is that when you used to go very far into the cave, the back is now blocked by sand and a part of debris, there was a big altar called Fingal's Table. Now, you have to look into the background. Why Fingal? Why the name? What does it mean in the Celtic world? Well, Fingal is the guardian into the other world. So it begins to tell you that something was going on at this very hard to reach cave. And the tunnel extends all the way under Mall for exactly 18.6 miles, which, I, and I don't know how they figure this stuff out, it's extraordinary. 18.6 just happens to be the number of years of the full lunar cycle, what you call the Metonic cycle. Now what are the chances that you're finding a ritual lava tube under an entire island that mimics your journey through the other world and out that happens to be exactly the same as the lunar calendar? Uncanny coincidence for sure, but the funny thing is that the sacred sites and chambers that were used for initiation actually do come under protection of lunar deities. And I thought that was just symbolic until I found out that your body, if you decide to immerse yourself for a, a good period of time in any dark environment, it stops calibrating itself to the solar cycle, which of course is 24 hours. It begins instead to adapt to a 24.85 hour biological rhythm. And that is the rhythm of the lunar cycle. So now we know why these temples were associated and came under the protection of a lunar deity. It's trying to tell you something very scientific. Well, the tunnel in the old days, before the, uh, the back of the, uh, the tunnel caved in, you could actually re-emerge on the other side of Mal, and you would come to face Venus and the equinox sunrise. And what's more, it's a, you can only reach it by water. And the cave where you come out is called the Cave of the Young Maiden, which I found to be very odd because there is no habitation around there. There is no stories of women being stranded in that cave. And basically, it's just this haphazard name that someone gave it. Well, you take a look at the initiation and what was going on. Uh, initiates who entered the other world successfully and uh, acquired a specialist knowledge when they were there, they were said to uh, create a kind of alchemical marriage. They married a divine bride or a divine maiden, a divine virgin, and at that point they became single people. The masculine and the feminine has become one, and then they return married to this divine bride. So there's something about these legends of the, spirit, of the place that actually gives away the reason why they were used. The third site is Iona. Surprise, surprise, but it's not the Abbey. I am actually very attracted to this particular building, and there are two ceremonial hotspots of energy already in use uh, by the Druids uh, about 200 BC. 
This is not one of them. This is the, my favorite, particular favorite one, and it's the Chaldee Chapel. And the Chaldee arrived here on Iona in 37 AD. And a lot of archaeologists and historians will say, that's a lot of hogwash. No one could travel all the way from uh, the uh, Middle East that far uh, a lot to Scotland in 37 AD, which makes, of course, the, uh, well, makes Glastonbury kind of superfluous because Joseph of Arimathea was doing it on a weekly basis. So we know it happened. Um, so here's what you do. You, all you have to do is take a compass and you look at the, um, the, con the date of consecration that would have been established based on the alignment of the chapel. And it turns out there's a slight deviation from pure east and when you look at the alignment of the horizon in 37 AD on the spring equinox, the chapel is perfectly aligned to the rising of Venus just before the sunrise. And that, of course, is the symbol of the risen initiate which is exactly what the Chaldee were into. So now we know. But later, Columba, he, he was a very interesting guy, lovely uh, fellow, kicks the Druids off the island, kicks the Chaldee off the island, kicks the women off the island, lovely Christian fellow. Um, his right-hand man was actually a much more forgiving guy because he actually rebuilt the chapel that exists today. And he came across this legend with, associated with the chapel. And it said, how the walls came down as fast as they went up as though by magical intent. And only when a person is buried alive will the stones remain upright. To which Odin said, bollocks. I'm gonna have myself buried alive just to prove this is a whole bunch of pagan nonsense. By the way, pagan means someone who lives in the country. That's all it means. Uh, like a heretic, someone in possession of the facts who is able to choose. That's what a heretic means. Funny how language has a way of reinventing itself. So Odrum has himself buried alive. Three days later, he's dug out. First thing he says is, all that's been said of hell is absolute nonsense. So this guy has buried himself alive in a hot spot of energy, geomagnetism, which of course does all wonderful things to your mind. He's had an other world experience. He's actually left the body, come back, recognize there's nothing to fear, there is no hell. It's actually quite nice on the other side. So what the legend is essentially is telling us is that it alludes to bringing down the walls of perception between the physical and the non-physical reality. And that's the whole purpose of why you'd want to undertake an initiation, to find out that the next world is not that different from this one. Now, Yes, that is a person, just for scale. Um, we think we have big giants, graves, and mounds in this country. Oh dear, where can you travel to uh, the Carpathian region around the Black Sea? Uh, used to be uh, the home of a race that was older than the Egyptians, and they were called the Scythian culture. And they built colossal earthen mounds with internal stone chambers. Um, they built these massive colossal earthen mounds with internal stone chambers. And they are built of alternating layers of organic and inorganic material. And what this does, it helps to shield the interior of the mound from exterior frequencies so that the inner chamber is of a frequency that allows the brain into a receptive meditative state. And in many of the recent archaeological digs in this part of the Black Sea, the archaeologists again have been puzzled to find empty sarcophagi, yet they are filled with gold objects. These tomb robbers were really quite dumb, or they were just exceptionally rich. Because one of the, this, this is one of the things that they found. They found these ritual cups made of pure gold, and they're laced with narcotics. And the narcotics were kind of like... Um, they were like the ones that use in shamanism, but not quite. They actually go a step further in which they have certain poisons in them, which actually do allow the, the heart to be slowed down to a point where you are barely alive. And again, that mirrors totally into what the initiates were doing when they were traveling out of body. You have to come down to almost one beat per minute in order to achieve the state. What gives the game away that this man was used for initiation was the image that's actually portrayed on the cup. It shows a very barbaric scene of a bearded man stabbing a younger man on the spinal cord. Now this represents the rite of passage into the Scythian otherworld, uh, which requires the overcoming of one's animal nature. The conclusion be being the sacrifice of the immature younger self. So that's what this cup is trying to represent. 
And the image is identical to the later initiation practices of Zoroastrianism and Mithraism, in which the hunter stabs the bull exactly in the same location as spinal cord. And the symbolism then reappears 2,000 years later in Crete, which we know the story very well, of Theseus going through the labyrinth to kill the Minotaur. In other words, this is the story of the initiate wandering left and right through the dark, finds his animal self, slays his animal self, and resurrects as a Christed individual. And it suggests that some of the mounds, um, the long barrows used for, uh, that were built, were used for ritual, and not all were used for burial, which seems to have come much later in their existence. So we can, read, we can sort of look at these places in a completely different light. So the use of narcotics also explains why certain farm animals have stumbled upon this very ancient system of information. <laughs> this is what comes from living in a real democratic country with freedom of the press. Yes, front page of the Independent, who'd have believed? The sheep are taking over the world. Well, if you can't travel to the Black Sea, you can go around the corner here to um, the West Kennet Long Barrow. Um, the, because the mound tradition of the Scythians moved west and into the British Isles. And again, not all were burial sites. That came much later when the understanding of the sites was lost. And uh, West Kennet is unusual uh, in relationship to the other mounds of the area and the giant's graves of the area because it is aligned to the equinox sunrise. And before, the, uh, the big stone that you now see in front of it uh, uh, covering the entrance, that was put there about 1200 BC when the local shamans recognized that people would be abusing the power of these sites because energy is just energy. It doesn't give a damn, okay? It doesn't have a conscience. It's your intent that directs the flow of that energy and that you can apply it for right action or wrong action. And they saw the change in seasons coming in our human consciousness, where we are today, and they decided to shut the place down for good. And that's when they finally put the bones in there. And the bones that you'd find in there are never the full skeleton. You'd find in the uh, chambers the long head skulls of very tall people, the tibia and the forefinger. And the idea was that when you and I would go into this chamber, you would touch the, uh, the bones of these deceased shaman, and it kind of, it's kind of like you're sort of using them as a mnemonic device, a method for allowing you to connect better with the other world, because you're kind of, in a way, touching their DNA of people who have already gone. That's what, what they said they used it for, as a kind of a, a mechanism. Uh, because they felt that the bones, and specifically the head, the tibia, and the forefinger, were recognized as carrying most of the, the memory, the DNA of the shaman. So there's a reason why these mounds are similar, uh, well, and similar temples actually resemble the mouth of a mythical being, because they kind of do, don't they? They kind of look like teeth. And uh, specifically, um, actually, no, let me go back a little bit. Uh, when you prepare for initiation, you first have to be metaphorically defleshed. You don't have to be skinned alive. It's all part of a metaphorical defleshing of the individual, individual because the idea is you have to take as little of your physical self into the other world. You have to fast. You have to be a very light being physically in order to leave the body. So it's part of the uh, process of assisting yourself and making the journey so much easier. It also explains why heroes who personify the living resurrection tradition are always chopped up or they're wounded, or they are devoured. So there's people like Osiris, Odysseus, Jason and the Argonauts, Arthur, and so on and so on. In Polynesia and the Far East, the ritual huts actually resemble the mouth of a devouring beast, and in Central America, they even come equipped with teeth. Uh, and what you're seeing here is what the Central American people, the Maya, call a wits monster. Now the wits is a pyramid, and again, it reflects the sacred mountain. And the monster is the monster that devours you in order to enter the mountain and escape into the other world. The interesting thing is that if you count the teeth, there are exactly 33, and which of course brings about all kinds of connections with Freemasonry and everything. Uh, actually, it, it's, a, uh, it's a very uh, rational explanation for this. Uh, the 33rd degree of Freemasonry, which is the, most, uh, high, the highest level of achievement uh, of their understanding, um, no one really quite knows what it's about because it's a complete secret. So I'm now going to tell it to you and I'm going to have to kill all of you before you go. 
Um, it's actually not 33 at all, it's actually 32.72, except that you can't go to a party and say to people, I'm a 32.72 degree mason. It doesn't really roll off the tongue. So it's actually rolled into 33. And essentially, it describes the process of how gravity works with matter in the physical dimension. Uh, you can do this exercise yourself. You can take um, a table, take a, a canister of salt, pour the salt very gently, and you see it forming a beautiful kind of cone. You measure that angle, it's exactly 32.72. And the, uh, the teaching of this is to show that as an initiate, if you learn how to control gravity, you can leave the body in a controlled manner anywhere and whenever you want. And that was the highest level of achievement of any initiate. Complete control of gravity to escape at will and go walk about and return with useful information. The Mayan world has excellent examples of initiation temples, some of which you'll walk right by and you think that is a really boring rectangular building. And this is called Sat Tsun Sat, uh, which sounds like a mosquito with uh, running out of oxygen. Um, there was a conquistador priest that came here and he left a wonderful record of what happened in this temple. And he describes it as, and I quote, a place where they tossed those who had committed great offenses so that there they might die. And you go into this place and you think, it doesn't look like a prison, it doesn't behave like a prison, so what the hell is he talking about? And again, it shows how you know, ignorant Western people went to the Maya world and completely misunderstood the Maya metaphoric concept of living and dying. What's happening in this building is that there's a labyrinth, and it's on three levels of increasing height. The first level is set deliberately low, and the entrance, by the way, faces the equinox sunset. The first level is set very low to remind you to proceed in humility. And you go for this labyrinth, and suddenly you get to the end, and you think, well, where the hell do I go? You look above you, there's a flagstone. You push the flagstone, and you exit onto the floor of the next level, which is slightly taller. And you keep repeating the process until you get the third level, which is very tall, and you come out of the exit, which faces the equinox sunrise. So, it turns out that this story that was written by this priest actually was describing the symbolic death of the initiate that was tossed into this um, artificial cave so that there he may die, but only as a metaphor. Not far away, Chichen Itza, massive multi-purpose complex, grew over a long period of time for multiple purposes. And I thought that this building, the uh, Pyramid of Kukulkan, was the most important. So, first of all, you take a look at the story behind Kukulkan. He is essentially the Maya interpretation of, well, Kukulkan was a resurrected god-man. The story is very, very ancient. Uh, the Aztecs called him Quetzalcoatl, who, like a certain person that was born 2,000 years ago, is born to a virgin, goes away for 40 days to a sacred hill. He teaches a religion, gets crucified on top of a sacred mountain, goes into the other world, comes back resurrected three days later. Does that sound familiar? That was 500 years before the Christians even thought about, considered thinking that there was a continent on the other side of the Atlantic. So no wonder when they arrived in Mexico, they went, hey, we know that story, that's plagiarism. It's funny, isn't it? The building is important, but like all large objects, it distracts from something else of great importance. It's kind of like the, the, the Giza Plateau. Everybody wants to go to the Great Pyramid. Yes, it's very important. No one pays attention to the Little Pyramid. I'll, I'll, I'll leave that with you to think about next time you go to Egypt. Go to the Little Pyramid. So that's where I began to look at the other important structures around Kukulkan's Pyramid. And there are three that really do grab your attention. Um, when you study what they represent, they actually form a triptych describing the Maya process of initiation. And you notice how the three sides, again, they describe this recurring perfect triangle relationship between sites of similar functions. The first one is the ball court, not surprised, except there's no evidence whatsoever of human sacrifice ever having been taken here. Instead, the ball court is covered with frescoes detailing mysteries teachings concerning the, me the mechanics of nature, processes governing the planets, the axis of the soul into the other world, and the tree of life. The angles of the walls of the ball court, they have unusual building uh, angles, uh, which are really out of the ordinary. For one of them, for example, describes the exact angle of the axial tilt of the earth. 
So all of these things are completely incongruous with a gruesome game of death. What happened was, is that in the actual ball court, the initiates would carry mirrors on their backs because it was to remind them that when they learned these particular mysteries teachings in the ball court, that they were to become the mirror image of the perfection of the heavens. They were to draw down the heaven as above uh, to, uh, to below. So in the ball court, they would go about preparing themselves for the ultimate game of the gods, which is the life, the game of life, of death and rebirth, and it's symbolic. And all of the, the, the actual in, initiation actually took place right here at the Pyramid of Osario. It's a beautiful uh, pyramid, not as impressive as Kukulkan, and that's why people don't pay it much attention. But it actually encloses the original initiation cave used for a restricted ritual. And any good Maya guide knows about this, and it's not in the guidebooks. And in fact, it's not unlike most Central American pyramids. Uh, virtually all of them, including Teotihuacan, as you were just found, are all originally built on top of initial caves. Now, the main, uh, main stairway of the Pyramid of Osario, uh, of Osario, which sounds suspiciously like Osiris, by the way, but it's actually not. Um, it comes with the two serpents, which signify the uh, connection between earth and heaven. And of course, it is perfectly aligned to the equinox. And upon rising from the uh, womb-like experience, the initiate would emerge from under the cave, go to the top of the pyramid, and there is still a 35-foot uh, chamber, uh, like a well, that goes into the original cave, and you can still go up and down it if you pay the right people the right amount of money. And you uh, basically appear at the top at the equinox sunrise, and you descend. You never ascend the pyramid, you descend. And again, the local shamans will tell you that this is exactly correct. And after you've gone through this peregrination in the other world, you then go across the courtyard and you ascend here to see Venus rising before the equinox sunrise. And that is the mark of the risen adept. And here at Chichen Itza, this is marked by this wonderful fellow sitting in a very awkward position called a shark mool. And there you see what the initiate would see. The Venus rising above his navel. That's why he has that plate on his navel. I always wondered why that was there. So what I wanted to know is, what's Shark Mool staring at? He's got a very fixed beam on something. Well, what he's actually looking at when you stand there, he's looking at the central temple of the ball court, the very one that contains the frescoes filled with the mysteries of birth, rebirth, and the tree of knowledge. So once you start connecting the dots, things begin to make a lot of sense. Incidentally, in case you're wondering about narcotics, and this is where everybody gets, takes their notebooks out. The narcotic use for initiation is still used today in the Yucatan. It's called balche. Um, it's actually prepared inside a very large canoe. And you think, how many people were invited to this party? Um, <laughs> yes. Hmm. Uh, it turns out that the canoe represents the solar boat that ferries the disembodied soul, when the person is alive, on its allegorical journey along the Milky Way, which is the river to the other world, whose entrance is marked by the belt of Orion. And the same story is found all around the world, including in uh, Indonesia, uh, excuse me, in New Zealand, with the original culture who were the Waitaha. I just discovered this only a few weeks ago. Uh, this is why Risen godmen from Micronesia to Southwest America and Egypt are all affiliated with Orion. And of course, Osiris is one of those people. Uh, and as, as we became, uh, came to know him in Central America, he was called Kukulkan. So the story of the Risen Initiate associating with Osiris and the Milky Way as the entrance into, into the other world is a worldwide story. Still in America, or South America, and they're still scratching their heads as, how the hell did they build that? Great picture. The Andean temples also share many linguistic and ritual practices with the Middle East, uh, which surprised the hell out of me when I first went there. Um, and it is now known that around 3000 BC, a group of people actually migrated from Persia and Egypt, and then they went all the way along the north of Africa. They settled in the, um, in the Andes after founding some temples in the Yucatan. And then, because they got bored of building temples in Peru, they decided to make a journey across to Easter Island, which is about a little spot of land 19 miles long. They were really, I think they were Capricorns. They made things very, very hard for themselves. 
And the funny thing is, the same connections exist between these lands, same construction methods, same methods of clamping the stones together, same mythology. So we see that there's a, a tradition that seems to have began in the Middle East and has gone all the way to the other side of the world. The connection here at Saksai Huaman, or sexy woman, if you can't pronounce it, Saksai Huaman actually means the place of the satisfied falcon, except that in, Central, in South America, the falcon does not have any mythical bearing or any kind of shamanic bearing. Um, the condor, yes, but not the falcon. Now, a traveling Egyptian would actually be very humored by this um, uh, description because it is actually a euphemism for the falcon god Horus, the one who basically avenges the death of his resurrected father Osiris. It's essentially, Horus is essentially the reborn spirit of Osiris himself. And the phrase makes more sense when you see Saksai Waman from the air. Because when you actually redraw and complete the, um, the, uh, the walls, half of which have been destroyed by the Spanish, the, um, the original wall actually resembles the wings of a bird. And I often wonder if we had a bit more information, would this pier have a head of a bird as well? I don't know. We don't know. There's not enough information left over. Most of it is now built into Cusco, the city. What we do know is the sight line between, uh, between the observational tower, the center of Saksai Waman, which when you take a B to the edge of the existing wall marks the exact position of the winter solstice sunrise, and more importantly, the center of the entire site is, uh, matches the heliarchal rising of Venus, which we, know, now, we now know as a, uh, a symbol which is synonymous with initiation and the living resurrection tradition. To add to this, and Saksai Waman is a huge site, there is this huge oval plaza, part of which seems to be astronomical for sure, except that on its equinox sunset position, there is this chamber that no one ever pays any attention to. And it's a kind of preparatory room. It's designed like a cube, the symbol of matter, and it marks the entrance to a claustrophobic and meandering labyrinth of tunnels which you can actually walk. And when you do, and one of them is still completely covered, a lot of the other ones have been destroyed by the Spanish, this labyrinth actually resembles, again, the metaphorical path taken by the soul as it travels the other world. Because when you exit this tunnel, you come out to face the equinox sunrise. That's just Saksai Waman. A short walk away lies an extraordinary chamber, which I adore. It's called Kenko, and it's basically hollowed out of a solid bunch, uh, limestone butte. And again, like Tintagel, it is in carved in the shape of an S. And you think, why not save yourself a lot of time, carve a straight line, because you, you do know straight lines. No, they carved it perfectly in the shape of an S. For two reasons. One, because it perfectly follows the energy line that goes through the uh, limestone butte. And two, because the entrance perfectly aligns to the equinox sunset. It curves into this chamber where you could spend a couple of very comfortable nights lying down on that table. And then it curves back out into a bowl-shaped courtyard to face the equinox sunrise. And the thing you'll notice when you leave here, and it's a huge courtyard, part of it's been destroyed as well by earthquakes, you'll notice this entire boulder has been completely hand-carved at a very awkward angle. And you wondered, why would they be doing this? Because the angle of the cut wall is exactly 23 degrees. Thanks to modern applications, we can now take a bead along this wall and see if it was actually allowing a, a sight line. And it is allowing a sight line because that 23 angle, degree angle actually allows you to view Venus rising along the actual edge of the stone at the equinox sunrise. There's also a second passageway, which is here. It's, it's cut in at 90 degrees, this side. And it too um, is cut through the bedrock and it allows a sight line of Sirius, which again is the star of wisdom. So it begins to tell us, these things begin to tell us that what this place was originally used for. Incidentally, just a quick sidestep, uh, why 23 degrees? Well, because 23 is the mean axial tilt of the Earth and this is this tilt which allows life to appear on this planet and nowhere else. And also, you'll find the same angle on the jet pillar, which is called the backbone of, the li of life and the universe. And if you go to Abydos and you look at the mural, who's holding the, the, the jet pillar? You have the Pharaoh Seti I as Osiris uh, meeting Isis, his divine bride. 
So this Egyptian symbolism suddenly finds itself all the way across on the other side of the world. Let's return to Kenko for a second. Um, you see this very unusual uh, preparatory area, and I actually was able to find, it's, it's, it's almost intact, almost intact. And I found the original blueprint of the site, and it shows that it has an unusual carving of alcoves that curves all the way around with exactly 17 alcoves, which is kind of an unusual number. And 17 is a recurring number in sacred texts concerning the mystery secrets. Um, it is the most spiritual of teachings, actually, because it deals with the process of accessing the other world. And its earliest appearance is in a Japanese text called the Kujiki, and it appears as the 17 ways or teachings. And that was around 8,000 BC. It would then appear later in China as the Taiyi or the Tao, uh, as we know it today. And then 2,000 years ago, it was still taught by the Essenes at the time of Christ and rediscovered later again by the Knights Templar, who became the Scottish Rite Freemasons, who to this day maintain the teaching in their 17th degree, and it's called the Knight of the East and the West. So that we see a continuity here over thousands of years. And this principle of the importance of 17 in part of ritual and initiation is enshrined in many temples around the world that we take for granted. One of them is Nauf, which actually I prefer to Newgrange, and the two form a relationship, because Nauf has 17 attendant mounds. An entry into interior passages faces the equinox sunset, it then makes a turn, and then the exit faces exactly Venus rising before the equinox sunrise. Same thing in Egypt. Same teaching is hardwired into the 17 side chambers of the Osirian, which once was actually above ground, not below as it is today. Nile, uh, Nile silt has made it look like it's an underground cave. So here you have a man-made womb where the rites of the resurrected god-man Osiris was performed with the 17 attendant chambers. Cool stuff. Let's see how these ideas play out in the Andes. Um, I'm sure many of you have done Peru's Sacred Valley, the journey through um, the Urubamba River. Uh, it actually did once serve as a pilgrimage route from Cusco, and they followed the Urubamba River for sure, which is considered to be the terrestrial counterpart of the Milky Way, which itself, of course, is the pathway of the, of the Andean other world and the gateway to this paradise. And back in the day, the festivities were performed at the temples along the way, beginning at Tombo Mache with the ritual bathing and baptism, and they culminated, of course, at Machu Picchu. And here, there was a festival that was timed to coincide with the winter solstice, which is the time of resurrection of the solar hero, also mimicking the sun. On the third day, after all the festivities, a small group of initiates was set aside from the general crowd and allowed into the sacred precinct. This is what they described as the few and the many, and anybody here who's Christian will understand this phrase that was often uttered by Jesus. There are many, not many structures that survive today in the oldest part of Machu Picchu, but they are impressive, but they do offer clues as to what took place here, because right beside this area is this extraordinary chamber, and it's a cleft cut right out of the bedrock with an ashlar that looks suspiciously like the ashlar found in the entrance, the original entrance to the Great Pyramid of Egypt. There may be a relationship. The funny thing is that though all those angles that are uh, cut in the rock allow the sunrise of the equinox to enter this tiny chamber. And when you look inside this chamber, there are two doors that go nowhere. Kind of like a, an empty sarcophagus. And these two doors, they both represent truth and falsehood. And it's one of the central themes in the mystery's teachings on the road to final initiation. You have to check your responsibility with this information. Are you going to use it for right action or for wrong action? If it's wrong, you take the left door, you're out of there. And that's your three years of teaching gone. And in fact, this teaching was still being taught in the Greek mystery school of Zeno in the fifth century BC. And there he is showing the two doors of truth and falsehood to his initiates. But the final step, as it turns out, of, uh, of initiation did not take place at Machu Picchu at all. Machu Picchu means old bird. It suggests that this place is where the individual comes to die, metaphorically speaking, and then he or she is reborn on the adjacent peak of Huana Picchu, which means the new bird. 
The idea behind Huwanu Pishu was to mimic the challenge faced by the soul in the other world before its final ascent to the highest point of light. And on Huwanu Pishu, one of the first descents is actually not to the top, but you have to go downhill 1,200 feet to a secluded temple that most people actually miss. And surprise, surprise, the temple is dedicated to the moon. Now here candidates would immerse themselves in total silence and darkness in a womb-like setting. And when you stand here and look at the sight line, it's not a natural sight line. It's not a place where you think, well, they should have really looked, the temple should be looking over there because it's just perfect. No, it's actually angled in a strange way. So it actually is angled to reference a cleft on the huge mountain above it, uh, which is about, I want to guess about 12 and a half thousand feet. And that is the only place, that cleft is the only place that allows the, uh, the view of Venus rising before the sunrise on the spring equinox, precisely as dictated by the initiation code. So that my guess is that the initiates rose to see Venus, then legged it 1,600 feet to the summit in time to see the next brightest object, which is, of course, the sunrise. Still in that part of the world, another mystery, the Chupas. Orthodox story, there's a place of burial, except there's no body found inside. Uh, the only burials found in here are intrusive. And even the early chroniclers talk about how, the, uh, including the Ayamara, they talk about how these uh, places are not for burial. They are houses of the soul, not for the soul. They are places not for resting, but places of facilitation. And the first clue is that the, uh, the inside is built like a beehive chamber. And that was the design of preference for temples used for initiation rituals worldwide. We'll come to that again in a second. The next two clue is that the, all the entrances face the equinox sunrise. And it's always an awkward entry, uh, uh, which features a removable plug, as though whoever was put in there was allowed to come out at some point in the later stages. And the clue three is actually the two dogs that you see carved on either side in relief. Those are the two dogs that guide the soul as it crosses through into the other world and it still can't see through the dark. The dogs can see for you until you get acclimated. We know this story in Egypt with the story of Anubis. We know it in Wales as the Kum Anmun and also of course the Hounds of Hades in, um, in Greece. And, this, and the fourth uh, clue is this carving. A male and a female. Uh, essentially, what, we, what it means to me is the, the sacred marriage, where the initiate has the, uh, coupled with his divine virgin, with his divine bride, and they have become one. So this is basically a culture shared symbol all across the world, because you find the same concept of the beehive and the mating of the individual in Malta. Uh, the bee and the honeycomb, all of these symbols are all motifs carved into the walls of the temple of Hayar Im in Malta. And it's about, well, it's at least pre-5000 BC. You see the honeycomb shape there? Wonderful. Um, it's perhaps for this reason that Malta served as the location for Homer's myth of Odysseus, who is the man who experiences a kind of resurrection through his contact with special information uh, personified by a beautiful goddess, a divine virgin, while he's actually in the other world. You may wonder why the symbol of the bee and the beehive and the honey keeps coming up, whether it's in temple design, decoration, or metaphor. Um, its first appearance is actually in Persia in 3000 BC. Um, they, uh, where they are associated with a secret initiation rites presided by people who heralded from a divine bloodline, whose emblem was the bee. And by extension, honey referred to the collecting and ingesting of the sacred knowledge discovered only during contact with the other world. The reference appears in the Sumerian Song of Inanna, a lunar goddess who takes on a bridegroom in the form of a shepherd called Tammuz, who marries this divine virgin and becomes a resurrected godman on the winter solstice. Inanna herself, and here she is, she was called a hierodul, which means a sacred woman. It was a term that was awarded to the high priestesses who presided over the final initiation ceremony in a restricted chamber. And their scarlet robes of office represented something called ritu, which is where we get the word ritual from, and it means truth. Now, when the Bible was being translated across Europe, there were certain problems with words because none of them matched. And hierodul was mistranslated into harlot, and it allowed the church to minimize the importance of the feminine in sacred ritual and conveniently identify the woman in red with prostitution. Except that back then, in the Middle Ages, the harlot actually referred to a male prostitute. Oh dear. A male courtesan. 
So the position of the high, priestesses, the high priestess highlights the importance of women at the highest level of temple initiation for two reasons. One, the knowledge was gener uh, generally passed along a female bloodline, and two, they were responsible for the initiate's safety while lying comatose in a restricted chamber or sarcophagus. The priestesses actually hummed during the entire process like a form of protection, like creating a force field around the body without the soul, and they actually resemble the sound of bees, hence why they were nicknamed the bees. Here's a wonderful sarcophagus that was actually used for the resurrection ritual. The final stage was the most riveting. It was also the most secret. Very little information appears, and I've had to dig under some extraordinary rocks to find this stuff. What I do know is that it involved a very dangerous procedure involving a well-controlled near-death experience, where in which the initiate spent several days out of body. And the chamber where this was conducted was called a bridal chamber. Why was it a bridal chamber? Well, because there, during their soul's flight into the other world, the initiate was set to engage in a sacred marriage. So, what more do we know about this bridal chamber and the bride? She was the divine virgin that was idolized by the Knights Templar, who rediscovered her bridal chamber under Temple Mount, which had been used by their forebears, the Essenes, a thousand years earlier, and who called it by the very same name, the bridal chamber. Before then, it is mentioned in the book of Ezekiel how during the time of Solomon, and I quote, the elders engaged in secret mysteries of Egyptian provenance in a bridal chamber under Temple Mount. But its origin goes back further still. It appears in the cult of Mithra around 6000 BC, which became the foundation of Zoroastrian mysteries teachings. And in the final stage of their ritual, the initiates used a bedchamber during a bridal ceremony called Nymphus, the notable difference being that no flesh and bone woman was ever involved. The Mithran initiatory path was the one used by Jesus eventually. Uh, in the suppressed Gospel of Philip, there's a reference is made to a restricted room used by Jesus called a bridal chamber. And this is what he says. Jesus did everything in a mystery, a baptism, a Eucharist, a redemption, and a bridal chamber. In fact, Philip even describes how only a son of the bridal chamber is in a position to receive spiritual resurrection and that the ritual performed inside these special rooms was essential to understand the greatest mystery of all. And in fact, when you hear about Jesus being called the son of God, it actually reveals his highest level of initiation. Because when you first joined the mystery schools, you came in as a neophyte and you were called a, um, let's see, a son of woman. When you graduated after your first year, you graduated as son of man. In your second year, you graduated as son of the gods. And if you should achieve that high level where you actually crossed into the other world, came back into your body and you're still perfectly alive, that's when you are declared son of God. So the church inadvertently lets the cat out of the bag. But who is this invisible bride and why can she only be married in the dark? Is she that ugly? No. Quite opposite, she's the most beautiful woman in the universe. And uh, because the ancient belief held that before there was light and matter, there was total darkness. And since God resided in the darkness and knew everything, therefore all wisdom must reside in the darkness. And because this wisdom is expansive and the universe is expansive, it must be embodied in a female deity a celestial bride or a divine virgin, and she, of course, personifies the laws of nature from which everything emanates. It was her wisdom the initiates sought in the other world and to whom they were wed when they found it. And uh, this is eventually personified by the Black Madonna, which is why she is painted that way, not necessarily because she came from Africa. In the Celtic world, Bridal chambers are presided by the goddess Bridie, uh, the root of bride, and we know her today as the goddess Bridget. One of the most famous examples of these bridal chambers is what's left here at uh, Kalanish in the Isle of Lewis. You still have the, the bridal chamber, which is added later than the stone circle. And yes, it's big enough for one person to lie in a womb position, and it does face the equinox sunrise. And the same thing for the Maya as well. Uh, their bridal chamber is the womb of the sacred cave. Uh, this is Balaka Anche, uh, which I usually say when I'm still not drinking. 
Um, Balaka Anche was actually chosen for its a specific ch a shape because there are many, many caves in the Yucatan, thousands of them. But they specifically used this one because it was chosen because uh, this shape perfectly mimics the shape of the vulva and the fallopian tubes of the female. And the pillar that you're seeing here in the picture behaves like the hollow reed. It represents the world tree connecting the underworld, the middle world, and the upper world. Essentially, what you're looking at is the tree of knowledge to which the initiates like Odin, Osiris, Shiva, Indra, Jesus, Kukulkan, and Quetzalcoatl were symbolically nailed to. And you see here at the bottom also the vessels which were filled with incense and narcotics. In fact, this bridal chamber in the Yucatan is even immortalized in the local legend of a young man who wished to marry a young maiden against the wishes of his mother, so he hid his beloved bride in the cave. That's the origin of the alternative uh, name of the, this chamber, which is Shtakumbi. It means the hidden lady. And the hidden lady is the woman that you marry at the very end. And you may wonder, was this, was this initiation experience a, um, a secluded club? Was it a hidden club for the high and mighty? Actually, it wasn't. Uh, this is a car door. And you find these all over Egyptian temples. Uh, in this particular one found in the, in the British Museum, it actually describes how a servant in the household of the pharaoh, Teti, was actually favored to join a privileged inner circle via a secret ritual. And in the hieroglyphs describes the surprise of the servant upon being admitted, and I'll read this out, to master secret things of the pharaoh. And the humble man continues writing, today in the presence of Teti, son of Ra, more honored by the pharaoh than any servant and as master of secret things. When his majesty favored me, he caused that I enter the chamber of restricted access. And at the end of this experience, the grateful servant proclaims joyfully, I found the way. Big clue, because this way or resurrection ritual was the same one practiced by the Essenes just as uh, it was by the gentlemen of the way in China in 2800 BC, and they called it by that name. Uh, that should read as Kaya. These people essentially, uh, they, they sought geomagnetic hotspots or mountains, uh, and uh, they described the experience as entering the mountain. And as we began to lose our ability to see this subtle energy on the landscape, we began to actually mark this uh, invisible energy uh, uh, with portals. We literally carved the, the portals into the other world on the hills. And here in Anatolia, we have a big false door, and it faces the equinox sunrise at a place wrongly attributed as the burial site of King Midas. Now, the locals say there is no such thing as King Midas, because Mida, in the local language, actually is the surname of Cybele, who's the presiding goddess of sacred mountains, who's also a local adaptation of Demeter, the, the deity who presides over temples of initiation. And until recently, the local secret societies even followed the rites of the resurrected godman called Attis. If you drove to the summit of this place, there's a passageway cut into the bedrock. It descends 900 feet into a restricted chamber, and you notice again the beehive shape, present yet again. And the site is actually referred to as a doorway into the other world. And its architect appears to have gathered a lot of air miles because he traveled all the way to Lake Titicaca on the other side of the world, and he carved virtually the same thing at a place called Hayumarca, which means the gate of the spirits. And here uh, you have this false door called Amarumeru, which means the place of the serpent, which tells you that right at that doorway there is an energy current right through it. And the fact that the hill is full of iron oxide also helps you have a wonderful out-of-body journey. And the local legends will tell you that the, the doorway represents a, an actual physical doorway to the lands of the gods where people find immortality in the other world. The odd thing is, is that the, uh, one in, the site in Turkey, the Azili Kaya, is actually found in the Ayamara language in Lake Titicaca. And they say, well, yes, that means the place of the old bearded man. And where have we seen that guy before? In the cup of the uh, chalice that was used for the narcotics in the Scythian culture. Strange world indeed. Well, you may be wondering, 
all of this here is all, uh, is all very interesting, but it's kind of, uh, is it kind of a dead knowledge? Why do we need this? Well, it's actually not dead knowledge, because the idea that many ancient temples were used for the ultimate journey of one's life survived into our historical time. Because the bridal chamber on the Temple Mound, used by the Essenes, rediscovered by the Knights Templar, whose, uh, whose inner brotherhood appropriated megalithic sites always dedicated to Isis or her local doppelganger, and then they created their own underground chambers in which candidates underwent an initiation to be declared raised at the very end, all the while swearing a vow, and I quote, to discover the joys of paradise. So obviously joining the Templar order was not for military gain because military people don't talk about going to join an order to discover the joys of paradise, the two that go together. So clearly the Templars are following some kind of development, uh, some kind of initiation that created a kind of spiritual development. And in Portugal, where these um, graves exist, they even carved their own ritual sarcophagi, whose length and width are identical to the one in the king's chamber in Egypt. And I'm not kidding you on this. So, in fact, those are the people in my group. I forgot to wake them up. I better go back and get them. Um, when the order went underground in the 14th century, the ritual was then incorporated into the third degree of the Templar's progeny, the Scottish Rite Freemasons, in which the candidate is lifted from a figurative grave, his or her blindfold is removed, upon which they are pronounced risen. Why? Because their exposure to specialist knowledge enables them to see the light, and thus they are enlightened to the mysteries of the universe, and they can walk the earth as gods. Today we call this uh, technique, by the way, public relations. If when someone's after you and they're going to kill you for this information, you just change your name and call yourself by another name. So they're still around today. Because practitioners of this last art of resurrection claim that the experience gave them intellectual as well as spiritual transformation. Many became architects of model enlightened societies. They became artists, writers, healers, prophets. And some of these people even possessed gifts of telepathy and clairvoyance. Many of these notable figures, such as Pythagoras, underwent initiation in the megalithic temples of Greece several times. He couldn't even get enough of it. And he journeyed into the other world several times and came back to tell the tale. Another initiate, Plato, even admitted how his participation in the living resurrection in the temples of Greece shaped his philosophical doctrine. In fact, I'll even describe what he says. True philosophers make dying their profession. How's that for a quote? They are glad to set out for the place where there is the prospect of attaining the object of their lifelong desire, which is wisdom. One will never find wisdom in all of its purity in any other place. So the overwhelming view seems to be that certain ancient temples allow an interaction with a life force that leads to an expanded awareness that can be applied practically in our daily lives. And as we saw at the very beginning, technology is finally beginning to prove this to be correct. So no wonder our enemies are knocking down the bridal chambers faster than we can discover their purpose. No wonder that the true concept of resurrection was falsified by orthodox religion, a point that Philip the Apostle unequivocally stresses in his suppressed gospel when he writes, those who say they will die first and then rise are in error. If they do not first receive the resurrection while they live, when they die, they will receive nothing. And Philip also explains that those who believe in the literal interpretation of resurrection are confusing a spiritual truth with an actual event. So ultimately, the benefit of interacting with ancient places of power is self-empowerment. And the one person who sums it up perfectly is Thomas, another apostle, who wrote in his own suppressed gospel, and I quote, whosoever finds himself is superior to the world. As for the rest of this very, very long story, have I got a book for you. Thank you. <laughs> Cheers, thank you. Thank you very much.